The separation of money and state, it's inevitable. It's impossible to circumvent the economic laws. The laws of economics apply with the same strength as the laws of physics. If you have some tool that uh, better fits the human nature of this drive for prosperity and uh, for the better future for the kids, people will adopt it. And there is nothing you can do against that. North Korea will fall apart in the end as well because you cannot change the innate nature of people to want to be more prosperous, to have better lives, to societies that are already on the Bitcoin standard will be just so better off that people will just adopt it. The hyper Bitcoinization will happen. There's nothing anybody can do about it. I'm very optimistic about uh, Suriname with the presidential candidate Maya Barbue. They have the election next year and she's a hardcore Bitcoiner. So that might be the next country to adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender. Hyper Bitcoinization in the first phase will be mostly about the global south. Africa needs Bitcoin and Bitcoin needs Africa. Bitcoin needs to succeed in Africa in the places where the internet coverage isn't as good, the financial literacy isn't as good, but these people need it the most. How, how big is the, the community in Czech? We feel like it's uh, in, in Germany, like there's so, such a strong community in, in the German speaking area. Is it the same in, in, in Czech? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I would say per capita, uh, Czech Republic is, uh, is maybe uh, like... Uh, the most hardcore Bitcoin community. But I can imagine a lot of people uh, uh, like have this impression like for their own country because, uh, for example, from outside, uh, people don't see like what's uh, the German content or what's the Czech content or what's the Italian content. And usually uh, the local content producers don't do that much in English. So uh, it's sometimes hard to estimate how the community actually uh, how large it is from outside but uh, to give you some some numbers uh, the largest uh, bitcoin only youtuber in czech has almost 100,000 subscribers uh, and that's for basically 15 million speakers um, because czech and slovaks we understand each other it's very similar and that's 15 million people so 100,000 uh, And it's, a, it's really Bitcoin only content. So it's quite good. And the Europe's largest uh, Bitcoin conference, that's BTC Prague. Uh, I believe it was around 8,000 people this year in June. Uh, yeah, so uh, the community is very, very large here. And I would say quite well educated in terms of self-custody, privacy, Vexel, uh, the non-KYC peer-to-peer network uh, that's uh, that's from Czech Republic. Uh, a lot of ecosystem companies like Trezor Brains come from Czech Republic. Yeah, so uh, I would say Czech Republic is quite important in the Bitcoin space. I love the conference also. Uh, let's just uh, jump into the podcast uh, with, with that as an entry. Um, I think I, I really loved the, the, the conference there. It was my first big conference that I ever was. Uh, and I was the past two years there and I will 100%. It's already in my calendar next year. So I will be definitely there. Uh, and I've been now to other conferences also, but I've never seen such a big conference where the crowd is such hardcore on Bitcoin. Like I've yeah. been on, on Bitcoin magazines once, I have been on other conferences, uh, but I feel like for the scale of it, like of course they're like local Bitcoin meetups where they have like 50 people, that's probably the most hardcore <laughs> crowd ever. <laughs> uh, but for like the scale, like the 8,000 people there, it's an extreme like a Bitcoin privacy security focused conference. I, I really like the one in Prague and that's why I also partnered up last year Uh, for two months to to get some extra ticket sales for the conference and uh, i love the, the partnership there and i will definitely do it again if if uh, if they're open to it because i really like what they're doing in in, in prague there yeah it really is amazing uh the kuchas brothers uh, the organizers um they uh, really pulled it off and the story there is uh they've been doing uh, like local uh Czech only uh, Bitcoin conferences. They started small scale, like a couple hundred people uh, in Ostrava, which is like the third largest uh, Prague city. So it's not even the capital. Uh, they come from there and they've been doing uh, this conference since 2020. It's called Chain Camp. Uh, that conference grew to around 2000 people. And then uh, they uh, they have gotten like, uh, 
ambitious and they pulled it off with BTC Prague. So they scaled it up. So they knew how to scale the conference already before and they've been running Bitcoin only events before. Uh, and that's why BTC Prague was uh, like, even the first year was quite a success, around five to 6,000 people. And yeah, they just wanted to do international event when they got the experience from local events and they were the best qualified uh, guys to do that. Uh, in, in general, I think uh, there's a lot of development and history of Bitcoin in uh, Prague, in Czech, uh, in general. Uh, you mentioned already a, a lot of uh, a lot of things there. Um, how, like, why is why did so much crew in Czech? Like, what what did maybe the the country uh, prime to to be so freedom and focused on on Bitcoin? Yeah, so I believe um, part of that is like general Czech history. Uh, because Czechoslovakia, uh, after World War I, uh, was one of the most developed countries uh, in Europe and also like one of the 20 most developed countries in the world. Uh, lots of um, like uh, heavy machinery was uh, was made here, like the automotive industries uh, has a large history in Czech Republic. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, like 1918 till 1938, uh, Czechoslovakia was on a really good track. It was basically the only country in Central Eastern Europe that didn't suffer from hyperinflation. Uh, our uh, finance minister back then, Alois Rashin, he was uh, a sound money guy. He wanted to return to the gold standard uh, from the pre-war -pre period. And he mostly pulled it off. Czechoslovakia back then uh, amassed around 100 tons of gold. Uh, we had a period of uh, deflation that was like government driven def deflation. Um, uh, Alois Rashin, the finance minister, knew the Austrians. He uh, quoted the Austrian School of Economics uh, in his speeches. So it was really amazing. Then he was assassinated by a communist uh, activist. So um, he didn't like finish that job, but still Czechoslovakia for this 20 year period was really quite advanced. Then uh, we had the Nazi invasion, uh, World War II, when we were under the Nazis, but still Czechs fought back. Uh, uh, like the, uh, the, the country manager was assassinated uh, in, uh, in Prague. So we fought back. Uh, but unfortunately, after World War II, uh, we didn't get back on the right track anymore. And uh, communists came to power in 1948. Uh, we had the communist regime for 40 years and uh, still there was always some kind of opposition to, uh, to that. So there's quite a lot of libertarian spirit in uh, Czech people, I would say. And in the 90s, uh, when the Soviet Union fell and the, the whole Iron Curtain fell, uh, Czechs um, managed to sort of get back on the right track in terms of free market uh, economy. Uh, Austrian economists were again quoted in the parliament and in the official discussions. So it was, uh, it was like a, a continuation of a very good tradition. And uh, I guess uh, Czechs always remained kind of skeptical of the authorities after the Nazis and the communists. And uh, so then, uh, I mean, uh, very early on in 2010, uh, there were Czechs that uh, understood Bitcoin what it, for what it is. And uh, to give some concrete examples, uh, Slash, he founded the Slash Pool, the world's first uh, public mining pool that is still in operation as a brains pool. Uh, then he went on to found uh, or to invent uh, the hardware wallet, Trezor, the world's first hardware wallet, uh, along with Stick. So Slash and Stick are the founders of Trezor or Satoshi Labs. Uh, Brains uh, emerged as a company that started to manage the Brains pool. Uh, and also General Bytes, uh, the ATM company, Bitcoin ATM company, that also uh, comes from Prague. And basically, all these three companies are just close friends that knew each other from from, from uh, like a hacker slab um, from before. Uh, so a lot of, I would say, technical talent in Prague, in Czech Republic. Uh, there's quite a good technical university in Prague. Uh, that's also uh, 
like very well combined with uh, sort of like a libertarian spirit and uh, skept skeptical attitude towards authorities. So Bitcoin took uh, took on very early on in Chicago. I, I love that a lot. Really, really cool. It's in the middle of of Europe, basically, and uh, it, it's. Uh, it, it, I hope this big Bitcoin spirit that we have in Czech, but also in the German speaking uh, area, there's like a German, the biggest uh, because we talked about before the biggest. Uh, Uh, German YouTube channel uh, has almost 200,000 subscribers now, uh, which is also massively impressive for me because it's just German content. Yeah. Uh, there are way more German uh, speakers, than, uh, not, not way more, but some more than, than, than from the Czech people, but still uh, really impressive. So I feel like we have a, a good grassroots movement here in Europe, but the yeah. policies and the EU is, is, is kind of... Uh, on the other side uh, of that, where we see politicians not talking about it. I don't know, is, is that in Czech also like the, the politician and the regulatory framework is against or is just not talking about it? Yeah, so that's a good question because right now there's a discussion about uh, sort of uh, implementing what you already have in Germany, where if you hold Bitcoin for Uh, in Germany, it's uh, 12 months, I believe. If you hold it, hold it for more than 12 months, there's no capital gains tax. And right now uh, in Czech Republic, uh, I believe it's a, it's a parliament, uh, there's a similar discussion that if uh, uh, like the test would be for three years. So if you hold Bitcoin for more than three years, there will also be no capital gains tax. Um, it's evolving basically as we speak. Uh, There's now like a campaign to contact your uh, parliament member, your MP to push for that. As I said, uh, the Czech Bitcoin community is very strong. There's uh, hundreds of thousands of people, I would say. And uh, so we'll see. Uh, by It should be implemented by uh, January. So if everything goes well, then uh, since 2025, We will also have zero capital gains tax if you hold Bitcoin for some period. Uh, there are, of course, some people uh, sort of opposed to that because it might mean that uh, the Bitcoin you hold uh, needs to be KYC. Uh, and there is a strong non-KYC community in Czech Republic. But I see it as, as an option. If you, if you uh, want to, you can have like a KYC stack and a non-KYC stack. And um, if you understand what you're doing, it's always better to have these options, to have the KYC stack that can be tax-free after some period and the non-KYC stack, which is like more private and uh, nobody needs to know about that. So uh, yeah, from uh, the like uh, top-down point of view, this is the major discussion now. Also uh, MICA, the uh, European uh, regulation, MICA. And uh, that actually, might be a little bit uh, of a help to check Bitcoin ecosystem because in Czech Republic, there's a huge problem with uh, banks closing down accounts of uh, the Bitcoin or crypto companies. And I believe right now there's maybe one last bank standing that's, uh, that keeps the accounts open to the companies. And with Mica, uh, One good outcome might be that if you have that license, the banks won't uh, be able to basically reject you, or at least that's the idea. But it's not my field uh, of expertise. I I just know from some podcast guests of mine that uh, this is this is basically the two uh, the two main topics in the political sphere in Czech Republic: the capital gains tax and the new European uh, regulation. Yeah, in Austria, they unfortunately had this period of like, if you hold it longer than one year, but they <laughs> actually uh, reverted that. So since like February, 2021, uh, mm -hmm. it's not possible anymore, but Germany still has it, but Austria, unfortunately not. Um, yeah, really cool. Um, you also said you want to talk about the, the, the African community, uh, which is really interesting for me because it's so different than uh, we have it in Europe. Uh, I, I really like to compare like different communities in, in, in Bitcoin. You also have the, uh, what is this? Bitcoin Ikasi, I think it's the, the shirt, right? Yeah, uh, Bitcoin Ikasi. First of all, like what, what are you doing uh, in, in Africa and, and what do you see there in the community? Yeah, so um, what I'm doing is running the Trezor Academy. So Trezor is the hardware wallet company. And um, 
we came up with a non-profit uh, educational initiative that's focused on the global south. So mostly Africa, partially Caribbean and uh, South America. And the idea is idea there is uh, to find local Bitcoin educators uh, that want to spread uh, the awareness, the knowledge of uh, of Bitcoin and how uh, of how to use properly Bitcoin, how not to fall for some scams and uh, uh, to offer them some kind of support. So Treasure Academy as the program, uh, it's, uh, it's a series of uh, three physical meetups where it needs to be run by a local Bitcoin educator. It's uh, Bitcoin only. Uh, there is uh, an explanation of like on-chain lightning, self-custodial versus custodial wallets, uh, hardware wallets versus software wallets. Uh, and my job is to look for these local Bitcoin educators, uh, find out whether they are like a real deal, uh, whether they really like are good at organizing uh, people, getting the group together that's really interested in finding more about Bitcoin uh, and if they are like, if they understand Bitcoin properly. And uh, yeah, then they run the meetups. We provide them with some merch, uh, some devices for a giveaway, uh, some financial resources. Uh, the curriculum is fully like written by me. And, uh, but th there are some local flavors because uh, for example, I don't know, in Jamaica, uh, the, the, the context is a little bit different than from, for example, in Nigeria. So we have, uh, multiple curriculums already for different parts of world, uh, multiple languages. Uh, so, so that we have like French speaking Africa covered and English speaking Africa, uh, Spanish as well. We have run the program in Venezuela and Mexico several times. And yeah, um, it's, uh, it's, um, like, it's not scalable to millions of people because we want the meetups to be physical in person. That's what I personally believe works the best. It worked uh, for sort of orange pink me and uh, all like the Bitcoiners basically that I know. Uh, you need some uh, real contact uh, with both the teacher and the other students, let's say, uh, because you have, if you are a newcomer to Bitcoin, you always have plenty of questions. And also it needs to be local because um, learning about Bitcoin from the major podcasts, let's say from Peter McCormack, uh, Stefan Libera and such, um, it wouldn't probably uh, give you answers to your questions in terms of how, uh, how can I use Bitcoin uh, in, my, in my community? Uh, because the use cases for Bitcoin uh, are really quite different from place to place. Uh, in some places you need uh, like the remittance payments to get money from your family members abroad. In other places, you're looking for uh, lightweight merchant POS systems. Uh, and in, in most places in Global South, it's not about store of value. It's not about uh, saving in Bitcoin. It's more about uh, getting some access to digital transactions because uh, there's a huge unbanked population of the, even if you have some digital payment rails, they usually don't work that well. Uh, cross border, um, you have load shedding, you maybe don't even have uh, like a smartphone, you have the feature phone, and there are solutions for all of that, but uh, you won't usually find out about them from like the major global podcasts. So you need like this local flavor. And yeah, that's what we do with Treasure Academy. Uh, it's uh, Bitcoin meetups by locals for locals. I, I love that a lot. Really, really cool. Um, and you also like you write that curriculum, but you also wrote uh, a book, I think, uh, where you talk about the separation between money and state. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the book is called Bitcoin Separation of Money and State. And um, yeah, I first wrote that book uh, just in Czech, my language, um, because it's uh, I sort of uh, thought about it as a, a concise version of uh, the Bitcoin standard by Seyfedin. And uh, there, there wasn't any such book in, uh, in Czech uh, at 
the time when I was writing it, which was in 2020. Uh, it's translated into English. Uh, people still find value in it, even though like uh, it's like not that revolutionary in terms of Bitcoin books. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have like a uh, very good uh, feedback on the book. Uh, we send it to Africa or uh, South America as part of the Treasure Academy program, along with uh, with a book by Camer Cameroonian author that's called Bitcoin Kids. Uh, that's like a little bit of a cartoon take on Bitcoin. Uh, but to get back to my book, uh, so uh, the content of the book is uh, uh, a little bit of an explanation of monetary history and why uh, uh, the government or uh, the king or the ruler always debases the currency. It's not just the problem of fiat currency. It used to be a problem uh, with like uh, the coined uh, sound money currency, let's say. So with gold and silver, you always had uh, some debasement going on, uh, even though like uh, the, uh, the coin uh, stayed uh, undebased for hundreds of years. There always comes some crisis, uh, some ruler that wants to uh, get something for free. So they debase the currency like a couple of percent in terms of uh, gold or silver content. And then you always see how it falls off. And within a couple of years, the currency is totally, totally debased uh, and destroyed. And we have seen that in Greece, in Rome, in uh, in the colonial period in in America, uh, and basically everywhere we look, uh, and fiat is just uh, like a logical, um, um, like it follows logically from that uh, because the ruler always looks for ways how to get some funds without direct taxation, and uh, the currency debasement uh, is the is the way how to do that, uh, and like from that basis i explain the concept of time preference how uh, the currency uh, in, uh, influences uh, the individual and societal time preferences meaning uh, how much we plan uh, for our future uh, both as individuals and families and societies and why we need sound money uh, to uh, have like a civilized prosperous society and why Bitcoin is that sound money or the best candidate for that type of sound money. And so that's that's basically the the, the, the whole content of the book. Uh, I really enjoyed writing that. I believe uh, writing a book, um, usually it should be, um, the, the author should be writing the book for himself. <laughs> that's, that's what I found that uh, I used to be into altcoins as well, like before I wrote the book, even though I had like my suspicions that uh, mm, uh, it's not all as it seems. And after I sat down to write the book uh, about like monetary history and Austrian School of, e School of Economics, uh, I convinced myself that Bitcoin is the only way or is it's the best candidate for like a global sound money standard again. Uh, so yeah, I highly encourage anyone to try uh, writing uh, either articles or arguments or maybe even books because it's a it's a great uh, learning uh, experience for for you I, I love that a lot because um, I thought I know Bitcoin quite well before I started the podcast and I did it like 11 months ago something like that so I'm, I'm soon hitting the one year mark and I'm quite aggressive with guests. Like I have every day a guest. So I have now, you met 280th guest. Uh, and it's fascinating how stupid I was in regards to Bitcoin, like 11 months ago, how much I learned now the, like, because I interviewed so many people. And because I gained that knowledge, I started just like writing down some thoughts and some inspiration that I had from each podcast and some learnings that I maybe had just to like organize my thoughts. Uh, and this document is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah. I'm actually right now in the process of like just ordering it. And either I make a series of articles or just like a small PDF book that I just like send everyone for free. Uh, but it's, it's really a nice process, like just writing down your thoughts 
is a learning process, which I didn't thought before like that. I just discovered that like four months ago, basically that writing is a really interesting thing to, to just learn, like just writing down your thoughts is, is a learning process. I, I, li I like the way that you're thinking about that. Also, um, the, the title was really interesting for me, separating money from state. I mean, there, there are even some Bitcoiners that are skeptical of like how fast we get there or if we even get there that uh, every state in, in this world will get rid of fiat money and that we completely live um, on money that is not owned by the government. Is that the idea of like uh, separating money from state that there is no fiat currency and uh, we have only uh, Bitcoin or any other sound money? Uh, I think there can only be Bitcoin, but uh, do, do you think that? Yeah, um, so my main org argument or how I think about this is uh, the economic laws always apply in the end. It's uh, impossible to circumvent the economic laws, uh, the, the laws of economics. Uh, and in a very similar fashion, how it's impossible to uh, go around uh, the laws of physics. I believe the laws of economics basically apply with the same strength as the law of, laws of physics. And we have seen uh, time and time again that uh, the politicians, the bureaucrats or the voters try to circumvent that uh, and imagine lots of economists like the fiat uh, mainstream economists imagine that uh, laws of economics are something that can be bent to their will and that it's just uh, like some convention that can be changed. But we have seen that like with the Soviet Union, with the North Korea, with uh, Argentina, Venezuela, Cuba, that uh, it never works. And it never works because people have some, uh, uh, they have this drive to be more prosperous uh, than they were before and for their kids to have uh, better lives. And uh, you have this concept of time preference, of course, as well. Uh, and uh, so the argument there is, uh, if you have some tool that uh, better fits the human nature of uh, this drive for prosperity and uh, for the better future for the kids, uh, people will adopt it. Uh, and there is nothing you can do against that. Uh, in the same way where uh, I believe North Korea will fall apart in the end as well, because you cannot change the uh, innate nature of people to want to be more prosperous, to have better lives. So uh, the separation of money and state, I believe it's inevitable. Doesn't mean there uh, it, it will happen like in the next five or 10 years. Doesn't mean there won't be any uh, fiat currencies uh, right next to Bitcoin for, for some time. Just means that uh, it will become uh, it will become uh, very hard to argue for the fiat regime as something that uh, is aligned with human prosperity, same as it was uh, harder and harder for uh, the Soviet Union to uh, continue the fairy tale that uh, socialism or communism is uh, something that brings prosperity to the people when the, uh, the Soviets or the Soviet citizens could see that uh, in West Germany or in the US, people were much better off, much happier, uh, much more prosperous, much healthier. And I believe like with Bitcoin, it's very similar to this clash between, let's say, Soviet Union and the Western style of capitalism. So the fiat regimes and uh, societies doesn't have to be nation states, but societies that are uh, already on the Bitcoin standard will be just so better off uh, and so, even so much more civilized, even in terms of, let's say, culture, that uh, people will just adopt it whatever they think about that because uh, yeah, people have this preference for leading better lives, even if uh, rationally, they have some, uh, they have some like weird ideas about socialism and uh, and stuff. So, yeah, it's inevitable. I'm very optimistic about that. Uh, Hyper Bitcoinization will happen. There's nothing anybody can do about it. Uh, so, 
uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's about it. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much i i, I love I, I love the confidence in in that and uh, it was fascinating for me to see how many Bitcoiners actually don't believe in that. Like how many Bitcoiners actually are very skeptical of uh, completely eroding fear away. But if you just like think about it logically, um, at some point you don't want fear. Like I'm already at that point where if I had a choice somehow, I would just not use fear anymore. Uh, and if that is not like 1% of the population, but like... 40% of the population or maybe even lower than like probably it needs like a small group of people uh, to really they push the, the tide over over that. How do you imagine that? I think the transition time is the most fascinating one because we are now knowing, okay, we, we are here with like a little bit of Bitcoin adoption, uh, but mostly everything is still in fiat. And what, we will get to the point where there's only this happy Bitcoinized world. Um, how do you imagine that transition time uh, to there? Do you also see like some some not so peaceful <laughs> transition there? Yeah, um, I think the Western countries basically have it worse because the fiat money uh, sort of works uh, for us, uh, for Europeans or Americans. Um, Americans maybe have it uh, the very worst because uh, the USD will be the last to fall and um, uh, they basically export the inflation uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, this petrodollar regime is, uh, I would say, very uh, important to the US. And uh, so the hyper Bitcoinization will happen in stages. And the first countries or societies to, to adopt Bitcoin are those that have basically nothing to lose now. We've seen that with uh, Salvador, uh, which was a dollarized country. They didn't have their own uh, like uh, monetary sovereignty. They didn't have their own uh, central bank, their own money printer. So there's nothing to lose, basically. Uh, the African countries uh, are in a similar position. Uh, Suriname is in a similar position. I'm very optimistic about uh, Suriname with the presidential candidate, Maya Parbhoe. Uh, they have the election next year and she's a hardcore Bitcoiner. Uh, so that might be the next country to adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender. Uh, we have seen Bhutan uh, mining Bitcoin heavily uh, in, in the recent years. So these smaller countries that don't really have this uh, monetary privilege, uh, they 
are the logical stepping stones to hyper-Bitcoinization. So uh, hyper-Bitcoinization in the first phase will be mostly about the global south, I believe. And we can see in, uh, in Africa, which I have some experience with, that explaining Bitcoin is uh, in some ways much easier to ordinary people than in the Western world, because um, these people don't need convincing that fiat money sucks. Uh, they understand it very naturally because they've been living that <clears throat> their whole their whole life. Uh, the payment rails usually don't work. Uh, a lot of times they don't have any access to uh, to bank account or to financial services, to mortgages, to uh, to like the classical fiat investments like the stock market. Um, they suffer from double-digit inflation for uh, years and years and decades and decades. You have the CFA uh, system in Central and West Africa. That's the colonial franc, uh, where I believe it's around 14 countries that have their monetary regime still managed by France. Uh, so zero financial or monetary sovereignty there. And it's a very exploitative regime. Uh, I recommend the listeners to uh, search for the article by Alex Gladstein, Fighting Monetary Colonialism with Open Source Code. Uh, it's about the CFA regime in Africa. Uh, so, uh, yeah, hyper-Bitcoinization um, is, uh, is a huge opportunity for these unprivileged places and unprivileged uh, part of the human population, which is actually the majority of the population uh, uh, on, on the earth to um, sort of leapfrog into a much better, much more civilized system that just doesn't exploit them, that doesn't steal from them. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's that's also why I like uh, working on Treasure Academy as such, as, uh, and as much, yeah, this, this is the article, thank you. Uh, because, uh, because um, it's much easier, <laughs> it's much easier to, uh, bring people to Bitcoin in places where there is no alternative to Bitcoin. Everything else sucks and everything else doesn't work or is trying to steal from people to exploit them. Uh, so Bitcoin, uh, there, there's a beautiful saying by Obin Vosu, he's the founder of Fedi, uh, Africa needs Bitcoin and Bitcoin needs Africa. Uh, Bitcoin needs to succeed in Africa in the places where uh, uh, you know the internet coverage isn't as uh, uh, as uh, as good. Uh, the financial literacy isn't as good. Uh, but these people need it the most. Uh, so uh, I'm really excited that uh, there's African developers, there's African educational programs like uh, B Trust Builders. There's uh, Africans building tools for Africans like uh, Machankura, where you can use Lightning Network over feature phones. Uh, there's African Bitcoin conferences, uh, the Afro Bitcoin and Adopting Bitcoin Cape Town. Uh, and yeah, a lot, lot of stuff has been happening in Africa in the past several years. Um, not that people know about it yet, I would say. Uh, but uh, what I see is just an ex exponential growth because uh, the environment is really ripe for Bitcoin adoption. Mm, I, I love that a lot. Is there I often see in countries like Argentina or Turkey where the inflation is higher uh, that they also often flee to the US dollar and, and do better fiat currency. Is that in Africa to the case or uh, is, is the this, those payment rates not that good? Yeah, yeah that's uh, definitely what's happening. Uh, yeah, to be realistic, uh, there is Bitcoin adoption in Africa and South America, but there's also like a huge stablecoin adoption. So uh, yeah, uh, the global South is definitely hungry for uh, USD, for dollars, uh, but the conventional uh, banking systems are not really able to satisfy that demand. So a lot of countries in Africa have just uh, US dollar cash, which uh, has its issues. So, um, that's one of the reasons why uh, Tether 
is one of the most uh, successful companies in the world right now in terms of their profitability per uh, the number of employees i believe it's one of the uh, one of the most successful companies ever and that's because uh uh africa and south america are, are really hungry for dollars and uh that there is like an like a euro dollar that doesn't need any banking system it's just a digital euro dollar so euro dollar euro dollar is like a dollar outside of the american banking system uh but like before tether before stable coins you still needed some uh conventional bank to access the usd accounts with the stable coins like tether you have the option to hold on to like a synthetic dollar just with your phone so uh yeah we see that quite a lot uh in the global south and i'm also happy that there are uh, alternative takes on like the stable coin product uh like blink that's uh the blink wallet used to be called bitcoin beach wallet uh they have uh, uh, an innovative approach how to get like the usd uh denomination uh, with just bitcoin it's called stable sets and uh i think it's uh it's a little bit more elegant than holding like a specific token uh that represents uh, the dollar value like usdt uh, so stable sets it's uh what i usually recommend if somebody wants uh to have like the exposure to the dollar or wants to hedge the bitcoin into the dollar value then the blink wallet with its stable sets uh feature i think that's the way to go Oh, really cool i never heard about that i heard about blink before but i never heard about that feature do yeah. you see kind of stable coins as a as a bridge to the to the bitcoin standard as a like a, a as a gateway truck to, to the to the actual thing yeah possibly um because if you use stable coins um uh, you basically have everything in terms of uh apps and ux to get onto bitcoin uh, you just need to make the final leap to accepting uh, the short-term volatility which um, is just the price we pay the price we pay for uh, long-term appreciation and like the sovereign uh, financial sovereignty because like usdt or stable sets it's still just fiat it's a it's a digital fiat but uh, it will still rob you over the long term <laughs> uh what uh, bitcoin doesn't do uh so yeah hopefully it is uh, like a gateway drug to bitcoin um and yeah i believe uh, in the long term it might be the case that people use uh stable coins or stable sets uh for like their short-term needs but uh understand that for long-term savings if they have the capability to build some long-term savings and that's a big part of us as bitcoin educators to uh teach like the financial literacy so that they will uh put away the extra purchasing power into bitcoin i love that a lot yeah it's uh, i think i think we we will get there um one thing that is i think like besides the regulatory framework um like if i could now spend uh bitcoin normally everywhere without paying capital gains tax i think that's one thing that uh, that really holds a lot of people off but the second thing might be volatility where you can play this game of like having 99 of your wealth in bitcoin but like having one percent of stable a uh, thing where you can pay with things in uh, in there uh, and with that not touching the bitcoin it might be interesting but i think once we get to a state where you can freely spend your bitcoin regulatory and it's accepted everywhere uh, and then the volatility maybe goes down that, then i think we really go hardcore on the medium of exchange um, uh, phase uh, do, do you where do you think what, what do you think needs to happen to, to get there is that the, the regulatory framework or the volatility or is there something else the, that you're looking forward to uh bitcoin accelerating from like store of value to the next stage of, of medium of exchange yeah well, uh, again really depends where you look in the world uh, so yeah us europe uh store of value is uh like 
the, the, the use case number one, because you don't actually need Bitcoin as such for the medium of exchange. We have Apple Pay, Google Pay, we have uh, debit credit cards. In Czech Republic, we uh, already have like uh, zero fee instant bank transfers if you transfer in between Czech banks. So uh, it's as fast as, uh, as a Lightning Network, which is really amazing that the banking system finally pulled that off. Uh, so yeah, uh, then it's a it's a, it's a tough case to make uh, if you educate like like Czech middle class kind of uh, people that they should pay in Bitcoin because it doesn't really uh, serve any use case for them. Uh, so so store of value is uh, use case number one, of course. Um, in uh, in Africa, in South America, uh, in places like that. It's the other way around. You need uh, Bitcoin or you need something as a medium of exchange. So, and you know, uh, the the value of transaction is so low and the uh, uh, tax authorities uh, are so ineffective that people don't usually uh, have this issue that they need to, uh, they didn't, they need to declare like the $5 uh, daily spending or something like that. So it's mostly this debate about uh, how to uh, use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange and how to change this tax treatment. That's really like a Western problem. And yeah, it will definitely help. Uh, sure. Uh, and even in the Western world, uh, Bitcoin has a very good uh, use case as a cross-border transaction mechanism because it's still not easy to get uh, money from Europe to US and, and back or from Europe to China. Uh, and so uh, like cross-border transactions are still an issue. Uh, and it's not a technical issue, it's a, it's a regulatory issue. You need to declare everything and still your transactions can be frozen. So I know like, uh, some businessmen that prefer Bitcoin, even like in our part of world, because it's just easier and it always works without any any hassle. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's good if um, the regulatory environment improves, um, but if it doesn't, still we will people will prefer Bitcoin uh, as a store of value because fiat will always degrade and it will accelerate in its uh, in its uh, degradation uh, we see that in the us where the debt to gdp is 120% uh, and uh, deficits are over 1 trillion now annually which simply means that the uh, zero uh, that the interest rates need to be around zero so that the state and uh, everybody else doesn't go bankrupt with uh, like uh, servicing this debt. So when the interest rates are near zero, that means uh, more uh, currency units will come into circulation and the purchasing power will erode and people will look for alternatives. And Bitcoin is just such, uh, uh, such an obvious alternative uh, that people, like, as I said, the loss of economics will apply in the end, even if you don't use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. It's it, like just using Bitcoin as a store of value in our part of world is, I would say, enough for it to succeed. I, th I think so too. Like it, it, it is the 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 thing how we vote. Like uh, if if everyone starts, I guess I myself, like I have hundred percent of my net worth completely in Bitcoin. Uh, I only hold a little bit in in fear, and usually like uh, I, I play the play the game of like I have a. Uh, 10k credit line that I can use whenever I want and can pay whenever I want. And the way I do it, I try to keep it as uh, at zero as much as possible. <laughs> and if yeah. I need a payment, I just like get a little bit in debt. Uh, and then with the next salary or next payment that comes in, I just like pay it off. So I'm like literally always aiming for exactly 100% in Bitcoin uh, to try to get an interesting Bitcoin standard. And with that, I never have to sell my Bitcoin. Uh, but I'm also like maximum <laughs> exposed to Bitcoin as possible without getting crazy with leverage or something like that, because I'm not, I'm not a friend of that, even though it can be very uh, good strategy. Um, the last segment uh, I want to go in with you is what do you think is the, the most important aspect of Bitcoin? And is this something that uh, you would change or you, you see 
that we might need a change in, in the future? Yeah, um, so I think the most important aspect of Bitcoin is uh, the monetary policy or the lack of any, uh, like, let's say, policy. It's, an, it's a monetary algorithm where uh, we'll have the 21 million limit in the end. And uh, that's the very foundation of Bitcoin and the credibility of that monetary policy. Uh, Parkour Lewis in Gradually Then Suddenly uh, wrote an, a very good article. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll remember the title of the whole series or the whole book is really amazing. And uh, he, just, he makes the argument for why the credibility of Bitcoin's 21 million is the most important aspect of Bitcoin. Everything else basically comes from that. So yeah, that's the most important. Uh, we can never touch that. I don't think there will be proposals, of course. I believe like in two or three halvings, we will have uh, serious proposals to uh, change the monetary policy, but it will never succeed because uh, it's such an ingrained feature. And again, it's uh, it touches on the very um, incentives of uh, everybody who holds Bitcoin or who earns Bitcoin that this monetary policy can never be changed. It will, will never be changed. Um, and everything, everything else follows from that. Everything competes to this monetary policy in terms of uh, store of value instruments. So gold competes with that, stocks, bonds, fiat currencies, altcoins, everything competes with uh, Bitcoin's 21 million and nobody can beat Bitcoin in that because it has the most credible monetary policy that, uh, that grows even more credible with every passing year and, uh, uh, and the worldwide adoption, even ETFs reinforce it. Uh, adoption at all scales basically reinforce this monetary policy and this credibility. So yeah, that's also why I'm so optimistic about Bitcoin and why it will succeed because uh, the incentives with Bitcoin are so well aligned with uh, what the mankind is and what we need, uh, even like unconsciously, that there's no other way. It's it's, it's so great. Do, do you think the, that strong monetary policy and that like that hard cap of 20 million or uh, anything like really core to that is could that ever be questioned? Is that ever from like uh, that that can be questioned, or like what ha has to happen that something fundamental like that could could be changed? Obviously, there is always the event of a hard fork, but that probably will not successful. Yeah, it was and will be questioned uh, definitely by two uh, different types of uh, people. The first is uh, like the fiat economists, the mainstream economists who uh, strongly believe that you need some kind of uh, monetary and price inflation to uh, for economy to work properly. Uh, I believe this has been disproved by uh, Mises, Hayek and uh, the Austrians long time ago. It's just uh, just nonsense. So anybody can read up those arguments uh, from Mises, Hayek, uh, Rothbard and such, uh, and that's that precedes Bitcoin even. So, uh, and even it's disproved by history, by uh, uh, let's say 19th century America, for example, being the most prosperous time under the gold standard that wasn't debased. Uh, so that's one group of people, the fiat economists, but we don't have to pay too much attention to them because uh, they have been disproved time and time again. The second group, uh, is let's say the security budget uh, type of people that are concerned about the so-called security budget, which uh, is the idea that uh, as this Bitcoin subsidy tapers off um, and we approach uh, the zero Bitcoin per new mined block uh, as a Bitcoin subsidy, uh, that the fees, that the transaction fees simply won't be enough and Bitcoin will not be uh, will not be uh, safe and we will see 51% attacks and uh, double spend attempts and such. Uh, I would say that's probably a valid concern, uh, but the answer, my answer to that is uh, basically what, what Satoshi said. In 20 years, there's either going to be plenty of transactions or there's going to be zero. So if Bitcoin is successful, 
uh, and its success comes from this 21 million limit, then people will use it. And if people will use it, the block space is so limited. Uh, and that's it's a it's a good thing we didn't go like the Bcash route with expanding the block space because we need that to be scarce, uh, precisely to have uh, sufficient fee pressure to fill the so-called security budget. So if Bitcoin is widely used, uh, if we go, uh, if we continue this hyper Bitcoinization path, uh, which I believe is actually happening then there will not be any security budget uh, concern because uh, the on-chain fees will be sufficient and we can debate what it means, but it's going to be just uh, plenty, I would say. And which means the on-chain transaction fees are going to be uh, quite huge, I believe. Um, but that's fine. You know, you know uh, the, the block space, the on-chain transaction uh, kind of, uh, moving money around, it's more like SWIFT or uh, ACH. It's these like uh, huge uh, settlement layers. It's not something to pay coffee with. That's why we have Lightning Network, eCash, uh, Fediment, uh, Liquid. We don't know yet, but there there's going to be a solution for uh, microtransactions. But it's not it's not on chain, of course. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think security, the, the security thing is like already, you can already see it a little bit. And I think we will never run in a security budget problem. And uh, the Bitcoin mining algorithm, or even like with the, the difficulty adjustment, all those things, as you also mentioned, the other things, uh, it's 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 quite obvious that it it will work. And it's, it's, it's an extremely elegant solution. And I think like, if if you don't get it to a full extent, it's it's mostly because you didn't study the the technical parts and the uh, security parts of Bitcoin uh, deep enough. I, I I see that question a lot with with beginners that I don't know, but how how can they even uh, get a budget when uh, the the sec uh, when the last Bitcoin is mined? And most people like that's just like most people don't even know that they're. There's also transaction fees and the miners also get money from that. So like, uh, yeah. I think we just have to do a, a really good uh, uh, work in educating people. And I think you're doing an amazing part in that with, with book, with the academy. I, I love what you're doing there. So I think we, we need more education and we need more educators. Uh, I, I always call them like the digital soldiers for for Bitcoin education. So I think we, we need as many as possible. <laughs> uh, and, and I, I hope we can push towards that really cool yeah really yes. cool thank you um then we come to the end routine uh the the first question of the end routine uh of two questions is always the same question what can we learn from you besides bitcoin well yeah that's a that's a great one uh, so i've become a sort of a stereotypical bitcoiner in that um I discovered the carnivore diet uh, and it just helped me uh, so much. I used to have like a chronic uh, eczema skin problem for 20 years. And when I got rid of seed oils and started to go like the animal based diet, uh, it basically disappeared, which is amazing. I never thought that was possible and no doctor would ever recommend a change in a diet. So uh, it's really uh, surprising how broken the uh, the medical system actually is even in like our part of world uh, so um, yeah i recommend like uh, trying that approach the animal based carnivore paul saladino is uh, is a sort of my hero in that uh, and his book uh, the carnivore code is very much worth reading and also recently i discovered like the barefoot uh, barefoot style like of wearing uh, the barefoot shoes or going really barefoot on on grass in the forest uh, and it really like uh, helps uh, like move you forward uh, in terms of your health so these are the two non-bitcoin things but uh, we see quite a lot of alignment between bitcoiners and these approaches and i think uh, it's it's a logical progression because Bitcoiners are looking for the truth, no matter what the mainstream narratives are. And it seems to simply be truth that we work better with an animal-based diet and, uh, well, like providing some freedom to our feet. So uh, I, uh, that's two points of advice I have for people that want to try it. I'm, I, 
I fully accept there are people that, uh, for ethical reasons, don't want to try the animal-based diet. That's fine, but uh, there might be consequences in terms of personal health. Interesting, interesting, really cool. Uh, I like how often um, the with the question a lot of family comes up, but also like a diet uh, uh, and things that we, I think. But the bare, barefoot actually never came up, and I, I was shocked by it never coming up because I know it's a big one in the Bitcoin community. I also know yeah. some some friends that, that are really big on that and uh, it's, it's an amazing experience like going going with your feet outside touching grass and uh, I, I, lo I love that a lot really yeah. cool then yeah thank you so much uh, we have another end routine uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, without knowing who the next guest actually is and your question is an interesting one uh, what is one question that you have never been asked before you wish you were asked uh, and what is the answer to that Oof. Uh, <laughs> I've been asked so many questions, <laughs> so it's hard to come up with one. Um, yeah, I imagine this takes some time for people to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. yeah, I've never been asked maybe uh, where Suriname is because, <laughs> because nobody knows like uh, Uh, about that little country and I discovered that country just recently and I think that's really beautiful about Bitcoin that uh, you get connected with people from a totally different uh, environment. Um, so I now know that Suriname lies in the in the north of South America and uh, there are Their official language is Dutch, which uh, was so mind-blowing to me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I recommend uh, the listeners to look up Suriname and their presidential candidate, Maya Parbhoe, uh, or so, sorry if I butcher the pronunciation there. Uh, and uh, I really hope, uh, I, I think that's the presidential race to watch, uh, not the American one, <laughs> but this one in Suriname in a tiny country nobody heard of. So yeah, uh, that's that's one question I uh, I would like uh, to be asked maybe before because it's, uh, it looks like a lovely country. I hope I will uh, get a chance to visit it sometimes. Absolutely. And for everyone that is uh, curious about Suriname or Uh, Maya, I have a podcast actually. Uh, I made a podcast with her like I think five months ago or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, where we talked in the depth actually about Suriname, uh, what the country is, what the country, why the country is special, and also uh, what her involvement in politics were, what she tries with Bitcoin, and all the scandals <laughs> around uh, Suriname. Uh, so I highly recommend people just like search uh, Suriname or Maya. Uh, but I hope she, you, you, you will find it easily on the channel and the other interviews also really good ones. Uh, I really, uh, I'm, I'm, I will meet her again in El Salvador in a month uh, and we will probably make a second round of the podcast uh, because it has been an amazing one and there were too many topics left out and we're like, let's do a second round of that. Uh, so I, I, I like uh, her and her mission and she's really a Bitcoiner. And obviously she's way more be a Bitcoiner as Donald Trump, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but the US obviously um, is a little bigger than Serena. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, really, really cool. Thank you so much, uh, Josef, for being on the, uh, on the show. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions and read more about you? Yeah, so uh, I'm on Twitter or X uh, as my name, Josef Cetek. Uh, so very easy to find. And uh, I'm also on, uh, on Nostra, uh, the same handle, or my NPUB is, I believe, published in my Twitter bio. So uh, these these two places are the best. Really cool. Thank you so much for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.